Exodus 17. <coughs> As we get started, I, give me some things that in your mind are great symbols as far as America is concerned, the United States. When you see a particular physical item, it gives you a, a sense that, you know, that's us, that represents who we are. An eagle, okay? A flag, stars and stripes. Anything else? How about the Liberty Bell? Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Capitol building, uh, the White House. Uh, there's certain things that that physically have a deeper meaning than just brick and mortar. Right? There, there's something more to them than just the physical appearance of them. And I think to the Jews in the desert, that rod, that staff that Moses was carrying around, came to have that sort of deeper meaning to it. At first I thought, well, maybe it was something like a scepter. When you get into middle period English history, everybody had a scepter and you couldn't come into the to their uh, chambers unless they held out the scepter. In fact, you go all the way back to Esther. Uh, when Esther wanted to go in before the king, if he didn't hold out the scepter, she was in big trouble. But he held out the scepter, invited her in. So maybe it was something like that, symbolic of the power that Moses wielded, but it seems to be a little deeper than that, a little more connected to Moses' place of authority in God's plan. Anyway, uh, there's three accounts in a row where Moses' staff comes into play here. There's the getting of the water from the rock, then the fight against uh, Moab or the Midianites, and then finally uh, the, uh, uh, the, the problem of Moses' ultimate authority and, and how, to, how to keep from overdoing it for Moses and the people. How, how do we put Moses in a position where he's not just the only one that has to take care of these things? So uh, we're going to start in Exodus 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses, and they said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there. They grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. Go and I will stand before you at the rock that's at Horeb. Strike the rock. The water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of all the elders of Israel. He called that place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord and said, is the Lord among us or not? Uh, we talked last week about how long you can go without water, about three days. Uh, you remember the last place they were camped? Had 12 springs of water, lots of palm trees. Seemed like a nice place. Seemed like, you know, if, if you're just going on vacation, that'd be a nice spot to park. Uh, God doesn't let them stay there. He pulls them back up out of there and they're, it says they're wandering from place to place wherever lo the Lord leads them. So they don't have a clue where they're going. It's not like you know, they could check the map or you know, look on their phone and, and see if, if uh, they're heading in the right direction. They're just going wherever the cloud leads them. They're just going wherever Moses goes. And as a result, they end up in another place where there's not any water. Um, and of course they're response is predictable. Why in the world did you bring us up out of Egypt so we could die of thirst in the desert? You know, you could have killed us over there just as easily. Uh, it would have been a whole lot less trouble for you to just go ahead and, and do us in there. So why use the staff? Why does Moses need to strike the rock with the staff? 
Why does Moses need to have the elders of the people go with him? By the way, when we say elder, we think leaders of the church. Similar concept, the elders were the older men who were in charge of the different tribes, the different groups. Uh, At times there would be 70 elders in Israel. I don't know how many uh, they had at this point. But he took them with him as witnesses, right? You've got 1.6 million people out here in a huge crowd waiting on water. Not everybody was going to be able to see what happened. But when Moses strikes the rock and all those elders who are close by see it, they could carry the story back to their people. And it adds to the authority of Moses for the elders of these tribes to go back and say, well, I support Moses because this is what happened. All the people got something to drink. Everything went the way it was supposed to go. Uh, Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 we get a mention of this occurrence from Paul. He is uh, trying to explain the, the, the terrible outcome of neglecting God once you've made a, a compact, once you've made a, a, a connection to the Lord God. Chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. I don't want you to be ignorant of the facts, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that was accompanying them. And that rock was Christ. So Paul puts a, a meaning on this Old Testament text that the average Jew would never have thought of. Right? The average Jew, and, and Paul when he was growing up, would have looked at this occasion and said, isn't it great that God brought water from the rock? And look how great Moses, his prophet, was. But then you have to say, well, what about Jesus? How does Jesus fit into this? So Paul takes this allegory and he says, it's as if Jesus was among them the whole time. They ate the same spiritual food, talking about manna. They drank the same spiritual drink, talking about water from the rock. God provided everything that they needed. What's the comparison that Paul's working into? The body and the blood of Jesus, right? The spiritual food, the spiritual drink, the thing that gives you real life. But Moses goes and strikes the rock, and it gives them the life that they need. Uh, Mentioned it this morning in passing, the woman at the well. What does Jesus offer that woman? Living water. Right? So there's that sense in which if, if you need to be saved, if you need to have uh, life to its fullest, you've got to have that substance. You've got to have that water. And so Jesus is seen as that rock that followed Israel. Did any of the Israelites know that? No. It was a rock and there was water. Moses struck the rock. They got, well, that's, that's what they knew. The average Jew in Paul's time That's all they knew. But Paul understood the depth and and how far back the promise of Christ went among these people. All right? Uh, Chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites tomorrow, and I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So again, same staff with which he struck the rock. Now the staff is in his hands. He's going to the top of a hill. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands were tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called it The Lord is My Banner, which in Hebrew is Yahweh Nisi. Uh, He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, 
and the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. There's a couple of neat things in this passage that I don't want us to miss. First of all, as soon as Moses has brought water from the rock, they get company, right? Lots and lots of folks lived desert nomadic lifestyles. There's still lots of them over there that live that way. And the presence of a lot of water is very important. So all of a sudden when God gives water to his people, I'm sure the Amalekites immediately caught wind of it. If, if they didn't catch wind of it, their livestock did. And their livestock start trying to find out where this water is. So they're going to win the rights to the rock if they can get rid of Israel. Uh, just guessing, uh, God might have shut off the faucet if, if they were there instead of the Israelites. This was Israelite water. But we don't have to know that because God, through Moses, through Joshua, wins this great battle. Why does he need to hold up the staff? It's a symbol. It's symbolic. It's like uh, going into battle and you look up and there's the flag. Right? This is the same staff that struck the sea and we went through on dry land. This is the same staff that struck the rock and we got water. Right? As long as that staff is up in the air, then the people who are embattled in the valley can look up. Moses is up there, the staff's in the air. They've got that symbolism that drives them on to keep going, so they keep winning. So there's two possibilities, maybe intertwined. One, the symbolism of the staff in the air rallied the troops. So as long as he held the staff up, the Israelites won, meaning the staff rallied the troops and they won. Or number two, God honored the raising of the staff, and so he empowered the Israelite soldiers to win. We know of times in Israelite history where God simply intervened and wiped out the enemy on their behalf. So it's, it's not at all beyond reason to think that God gave them extra ability in that battle to win that battle. That's the way they would have read it, by the way. If, if we go into battle, whoever wins the battle, their God's better. Right? So later on when the uh, Israelites are fighting against the Philistines all the time, the question is who's bigger, who's better, Yahweh or Dagon? When the Philistines win a battle and they steal the Ark of the Covenant, they take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in Dagon's temple right in front of Dagon like a gift to their God for being so big and so bad. Dagon, of course, falls over on his face in front of the Ark. Uh, they set him back up because they're idolatry. You know, how dumb do you have to be? And the, the next day they come in, he has fallen over and his hands have come off and his hands have gone over the threshold into that room, okay? Two days in a row, your God falls over in front of the ark. The second day, he loses his hands. Get the message. What do they do? Anybody remember? They come up with this tradition that even at the time of writing was still in place where they would jump over the threshold so they wouldn't step on the place where Dagon's hands had landed because that was holy ground because their God had put his hands on that threshold. Again, you don't have to be that bright to be an idolater. Right? So the, the hands, I don't know if they glued them back on or what they did, but anyway, Dagon uh, lost his hands, and the people who followed him took that as a sign that they somehow needed to worship him more. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. More about raising hands. First Timothy chapter two. The caption in the NIV has instructions on worship. The first half of First Timothy two is more directed toward males, and the second half is more directed toward females. Okay, so uh, you can almost divide it in half. We're going to read the first eight verses, uh, and look at what Paul says about raising up holy hands. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved 
and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to all, uh, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. For this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So why does Paul think that it's important for men to lift up holy hands? And what does that mean? Does he mean that when we pray that we should raise our hands? It's very possible that it was a cultural thing that men, especially Hebrew men, uh, did when they prayed. They would raise up their hands toward heaven. Uh, in our culture, it doesn't hold quite that kind of way. Some of the more holiness-type churches raise hands quite a bit. Uh, some uh, during prayer, some in addition to prayer, some randomly from time to time. They, they're used to, you know, uh, to raising their hands in worship. Our group doesn't raise hands. Uh, very few members of the Churches of Christ anywhere I've ever worshipped have been hand raisers. Uh, why did Paul think that the idea of raising up hands was important? Yeah, it's a directional thing. Uh, and that may have something to do with Moses raising up that staff. Uh, <laughs> I hate to use the, that phrase, but it's what comes to mind. Like a lightning rod, right? I'm pointing it toward the power source. There's, there's something beyond me going on, and he's the one that's using this rod symbolically uh, to touch, you know, to, to part the waters, to bring water from a rock. There's something above me that's going on, and as long as I keep my hands up, gesturing toward the Father, then we continue to have success. Uh, so anyway, I, I find it interesting that, uh, that that was something that they did uh, we have a few uh, groups, uh, Christian groups in the United States that do hand raising. And there are other groups around the world, different religious groups, that, that sense that somehow, you know, reaching up toward uh, God is the right posture for prayer. Uh, Exodus 18, verse 14. This is the, the third of the three things. And you don't get the the staff in this one particularly, but that idea that Moses was so endowed with authority and the symbol of that authority being the, uh, the staff. Uh, let's start in 13, 18, 13. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. They stood around him from morning till evening. Remember, there's 1.5 million of these folks. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions. Show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people. Men who fear God. Trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. And Moses listened to his father-in-law and put those changes into place. And it was a good idea. It worked out well. I, I like at the end that Jethro finally says, you know, if this is okay with God, if God commands and says this is fine, then let's do it this way. And Moses buys into it. 
uh, he had established himself, or God had established him, as a very singular figure, right? Uh, striking the, the sea with his staff, striking the rock uh, in front of the rest of the folks who then could go back and bear witness to it, standing on top of the, the hill with the staff in his hand. He was a very symbolic figure himself, not just the staff, but Moses himself had become a very, he was intertwined with all of the success that, that Israel was having. And so Jethro says, you really need to let some other people take care of some things for you or you're just going to burn yourself out in the process. And so he buys into it and, and it ends up being a, a good plan. Uh, go over to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And we see a similar kind of situation that comes up in the church. I think everybody should be familiar with it. When the church started at Pentecost, there were full-blood Jews, and then there were people who had been grafted in, folks that had converted to Judaism from uh, born Gentiles. And, and then there was a group of Jews who lived among the, the Grecian people. Mainly the Isle of Cyprus seems to be a, a place where a lot of them were from. And as the numbers kept growing, just taking care of folks and the needs of the folks was growing too. So in those days when the number of the disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's basically what uh, Jethro told Moses. You need to be in charge of communication between God and these people. You don't need to be involved with taking care of the day-to-day -day needs. It's too much for you. So here we have 12 guys instead of just one, and we have probably 20 to 25,000 people in the church uh, as opposed to 1.5 million. But the thinking is the same. The apostles say what we're trying to do, keeping people connected to God, is too important for us to stop doing that and worry about making sure that, that all of the people are cared for physically. And so they put into place what typically we think of as being the first group of deacons. Uh, make sure that everybody is cared for. Make sure that they have the things that they need. Uh, it's a good plan. It's a good way of doing things. There are congregations where one individual just kind of becomes uh, the only one that, that people look to. They're just... There's just one answer that they want. Uh, that can be dangerous. It, uh, what happens if that individual gets burned out? What happens if that individual has to be away? Then all of a sudden you have holes that need to be filled that could have already been taken care of if folks had been appointed prior to that need. So uh, Jethro kind of sets Moses straight. It's good, good to listen to your father-in-law now and then. Uh, they could be useful, uh, good people. And so... He listens to his, and it works out well for him. But you see the, the continuity here in these three stories in a row. Uh, you know, how, how difficult it must have been to be Moses, to be relied upon for such huge things uh, all the time. We think of Moses as being very powerful and being very in control and everything, you know, in its place, and, and he's God's prophet. The people of Israel look back at him very fondly as a great leader. And, and all of that's true, but he was a human being. And he was just squashed by all the things that were going on. He, he was afraid of the people at times. He goes to the Lord and says, if you don't intervene, they're going to stone me to death. Right? The people are so angry with me, they're ready to kill me. And God intervenes on his behalf. But how huge a task it must have been to be Moses. And he's got Aaron with him. He's got his sister Miriam with him. And, and there's other people that are surrounding him. But, you know, he is that symbol. 
he is that guy with the staff, and people are expecting an awful lot of Moses in those early days. Any thoughts, questions? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. God was providing enough food for them to subsist, yeah. but uh, there wasn't much banqueting going on. Uh, after they get to Mount Sinai, they, they start uh, camping in their tribes. Each tribe had a specific place they were supposed to camp. Well, isn't and, that kind of where he sets up the, I guess you call them judges or something there, for each one to, if they got a problem, take it to this guy here, And, and there's a lot of governments in the world that have mimicked this yeah. so that you have a, a county judge and a yeah. district judge and a state judge, you know, you work your way up. Uh, if, if you keep getting the wrong answer, you yeah. well, keep working your way up. Moses kind of started all that. I, like I, I think that this is the first time we see, I don't know historically, but biblically this is the first time we see this kind of yeah. arrangement being set up. I think acacia is right. Now, I don't know what acacia... Yeah, uh, and... I don't know. The, the rod that goes in the uh, Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod, and it budded. And I want to say that it was an almond branch. But so I don't know what acacia equates to, you know, in my world. I'd have to, I haven't ever looked that up. But that'd be interesting to find out. But yeah, the one that goes in the ark is referred to as Aaron's rod that budded. The question is, is Aaron's rod the same as Moses' rod? Are they interchangeable? Because if you remember, when they go before Pharaoh, the one that turns to a snake, it says Aaron threw down his rod, and it became a snake. Well, then later it's referred back to as Moses' rod that became a snake. So it, it, it may be that this one item, like when, when God is working directly through Moses, he has the staff. If God is working through Moses, and remember he said, I'll make you a god and Aaron will be your prophet, uh, it may be that the rod passes to the spokesperson. So maybe Aaron had Moses' rod at different times. I looked a little bit at that this week, and the the answer was basically the scholars don't know. There's not enough information to tell us whether there was one rod or two. This says the acacia tree is native to Australia. Uh, over millennia, acacia spread throughout the old world, including Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Rim. So I don't know. I'm going to have to look that one up and see what if there's anything in my neighborhood that uh, is, is acacia. So like when you look at Moses, or not Moses, when you look at uh, Noah, building the ark and it says he built it out of gopher bark, gopher wood, you know. Yeah. Don't know. Moses. Cypress would have worked really well for that, but I don't know if they had any cypress where <laughs> Noah was living. You know, God had specific ways he wanted everything done. Absolutely. What you got? Acacia. <laughs> oh. The wood of the acacia tree, the acacia of Palestine is comparatively small tree, uh, the wood close-grained and valued for its durability. Of this wood were made the Ark of the Covenant and its staves, the altar of incense, the boards of the tabernacle, and the altar of burnt offering. So we're going to have a lot of stuff that's made out of this wood. Uh, and it's evidently native to Palestine, not a big tree, but a little tight-grained tree. I have a piece of oak that I brought back from Florida that is a 
a staff size, and uh, I've always wanted to do something with it. But it's kind of that way. It, you know, it, it's not crumbling. It's not going anywhere. It's just a big chunk of oak, and uh, it holds itself pretty well. But it, acacia may, know, may be in that category. Right. I don't know. I, I don't know if Aaron, again, I'd, I'd have to go back and look whether Aaron was was already dead by that time. Joshua leads them across into the promised land. Yeah. But I don't know if Aaron was still around or not. I, I, I just kind of wonder. Yeah. And what Mark was saying, that they put that uh, staff of Aaron into the uh, Ark of the Covenant, but I don't remember exactly at what point that staff went into the Ark of the Covenant. So tune in next week. <laughs> same, same Moses time, same Moses channel. And you'll find out even more. What is Scott? It just says in chapter 4 that uh, the Lord asked Moses what it, he had in his hand. And he said staff. Staff. So he had it before. God didn't give him a staff of a certain wood. It's what he had tending the sheep probably. Yeah, he already had the staff. God just made use of it. Yeah. You know, actually, there was Moses' father-in-law that actually really taught Moses in setting up the judges. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Jethro, he's a smart guy. He was. He's identified to us at the very beginning when we first meet him in Midian as a, uh, as a priest of God. Yeah. So he's got some connection even before Moses shows up in town. But he also would have been somebody that would have known this group of people that attacked them, the, the Midianites, the Moabites. They all lived in that same region yeah. where Moses you know, spent the second 40 years of his life. So it was, uh, for, for uh, Moses and for uh, Jethro, these are folks that they're familiar with that, that they end up fighting with. It is. Anything else? Oh, I was looking at the picture. Oh, well, I turned it off and didn't look at the picture. I was reading the description. All right. Uh, more research to come. We're going to tell you guys bye. We'll see you later. Uh, if there's any.